Well, we have been in the midst of a sermon series on lessons from the wilderness. And uh, if you, uh, and I forgot to put the slides in OneDrive. So since you don't have access to my laptop, they're not going to help you this morning. So you get the morning off. You don't have to run slides during the, the message. So um, I knew there was something I was meaning to finish, and that was it. Um, but in, um, in 1 Corinthians, um, the scripture tells us and reminds us, if I get on the actual right page, there it is, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6, verse 11 tells us, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea and did all, drink, uh, all eat the same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, uh, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Paul makes very clear that these Things that were going on in the wilderness are for us as believers today. They're examples and warnings to us today as believers. And there are lessons that we need to learn from that. Uh, and just as a way of review, since last week was Mother's Day and we, we switched gears a little bit, but just going back, this is the uh, fifth message in there, but we talked about the wilderness uh, and how it is a picture of the Christian life as we uh, through the blood of Christ, the pa our Passover lamb, are delivered from bondage in, from the world in Egypt. Egypt pictures the world, the taskmasters picture sin. And we are delivered through the blood of Christ into a new life. And that new life begins in the wilderness, which is a time of testing and it's a time of learning for the believer. God never takes you from Egypt directly to the promised land. In fact, there was a very short route between Egypt and the Promised Land. If they had just followed the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and gone into the Promised Land, they would have been there in a couple of weeks. But God says he did not lead them that way because he feared that when they saw battle, they would be afraid and they would turn back. And God took them a different route, a route that would take them months through the wilderness, but along the way, they would get the chance to learn about God and the wilderness really is a time when God is not only trying to prepare his people for the promised land. By the way, promised land is not heaven, okay? The promised land does not picture heaven. The promised land pictures the fully surrendered, spirit-filled life that we live as Christians in the will of God. In the promised land, we still face battles. We still face temptations. In the, in the promised land, there are still trials and troubles. That's not heaven. Aren't you glad there are no more battles to fight when we get to heaven? There's no, there's no more temptation to overcome when we get to heaven. Uh, but in the promised land, there are those things. And so promised land is a picture of reaching maturity as a believer in, in how you walk with God. And whether or not you go through the wilderness is not up to you, but how long you stay in the wilderness is. Some believers are content to live in the wilderness and never reach the promised land. I want to help you learn the lessons that will get you to the promised land and that fully surrendered, mature, faith-filled life that God wants you to have. Now, let's review uh, the, the lessons that we've learned so far. The first message was on God's deliverance and how he delivered them from Egypt and how he brought the plagues, and then eventually, through the shedding of blood, his last plague passed over the Israelites but landed upon the Egyptians. And by the death of the firstborn and the shedding of innocent blood, they were delivered. All of that is a picture of Christ. Through the firstborn, God's firstborn's death, that's Jesus, and his shed blood, are we delivered uh, from bondage and from sin. When they get into the wilderness, God begins to teach them some very simple lessons. Uh, the first lesson was on provision. They got out into the wilderness and they came to a place where there was water, but the water was contaminated and they couldn't drink it. Plus, they were starting to run out of food. There's two and a half million people, and they're in the wilderness. It's not like they could go to the store and go shopping. And so they began to 
complain and worry and wonder about whether they were going to have water and food on their journey. So God had Moses cast a tree into the river, and the water became clean and drinkable, became sweet. And then God gave them the promise that each day he would rain manna down in the morning and quail down in the evening. So they had bread in the morning and meat in the evening, and God miraculously supplied the water that they would need for them and their animals. So they got fully loaded up. And then what God does after he teaches a lesson is he gives a test. And if you fail the test, you, you've got to go back and you've got to learn more about that lesson until you actually pass the test. And so to test the Israelites on the lesson of provision that God had taught them by supplying the water or purifying the water and supplying the bread and the manna, God leads them to a place, uh, the Bible calls it Rephidim, which literally means resting place. God led them to a place where they would stop and they would camp for a while. But if you remember, as we looked at this, this lesson, the Bible says, but there was no water there. God brought them to a place where they were going to camp and they were going to rest, but he brought them to a place that also had no water to it. Now, if the Israelites had learned the lesson of provision, they would have fallen on their knees and they would have said, God, we need water and we trust you to supply the water for us. Is that what they did? By the way, if I ever ask that question of did they fall down on their knees and pray and ask God to supply what they needed, throughout the entire wilderness experience, the answer will be no to that. They complained a lot, and they murmured a lot, and they, they got the wrath of God on them a lot. And so they complained, and they murmured, and they said, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die in the wilderness with no water? They began to impugn God's character, and they began to impugn God's integrity, and they began to impugn God's wisdom and his knowledge and his power, and they thought that they were going to die, and they accused God of bringing them into the wilderness, not to bring them to the promised land, but just to kill them all. And so God tells Moses to go out and strike the rock, and he strikes the rock, and the water comes out, and there's plenty of water for all two and a half million people and all of their cattle, and the water just keeps coming out. As long as they're there, they have plenty of water, and God miraculously supplies it. So in this refresher course, as God supplies water from the rock, God also teaches them the second lesson, and that is God's presence. They had the lesson of provision, then the lesson of presence. It's important for us as believers to realize very early on that God will supply all your needs. The Bible says, you know, I've been young and I've been old and I've never seen the righteous begging bread. Now he's teaching them about his presence. We must learn that God is going to take care of us, but we must also learn very early on that God is with us wherever we go. And in that passage where Moses strikes the rock, God told Moses, go and strike the rock and I will go and stand before you, meaning I'm going to put my presence right in front of you as you strike the rock, so that people see that I am here with you. And the Bible says that they, they renamed the place, and they asked the question, is God with us or not? Is, is God's presence among us or not? That was the question they asked. And God not only reassured them on the provision, but he taught them the lesson of his presence. I am with you. And the Bible, of course, says to every believer, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You have to know that God's presence is there with you as a believer. Have to know that. You, promised land is not going to help you. The wilderness is where you need to be if you don't understand that God will provide and that God is always with you. So now God's going to test them on the, on the lesson of his presence by allowing Amalek to come attack them. You remember we just covered that a couple weeks ago. Amalek comes and attacks them, and God goes out, and as long as Moses held his hands up, they had the victory, and they defeated Amalek, and they, they whipped him good, and they sent him packing, and God told Moses to make it a, a statute, a memorial forever, that God was going to someday get vengeance on Amalek for attacking his people in an unprovoked way. And so they write that down. And so now... They, they did well with that test. And then God led them over to Mount Sinai. Rephidim, that resting place, was in the valley of Sinai, was near the mountain. And then God brings them a little closer to the mountain. And Moses goes up into the mountain and God says, you tell the people that if they will keep my covenant, 
If they will do what I tell them to do, if they will obey my voice, then I'm going to make of them a holy nation. I'm going to make of them a kingdom of priests. I'm going to make them a peculiar treasure. And this is the lesson of promise. If we will obey God, then we enjoy the promises of God. And if we disobey God, then we lose the promises of God. All the promises are conditioned on whether or not we're going to do what we're supposed to do. And if we do what we're supposed to do, God is going to take care of us. And so we have this lesson of promise. And now that they've learned the lesson of promise that we covered two Sunday nights ago or a week ago before Mother's Day, now that we've learned this lesson of promise, we're going to skip all the way ahead to Exodus chapter 32. Because in between Exodus 20 where God, in chapter 19, is where the people say, all that the Lord has said, we will do. They, they said, we accept the conditions God has given us. We'll obey the voice of God, and we will let him fulfill his promises in our life. And so from chapter 20 to chap through chapter 31, God is giving Moses all the instructions on the Ten Commandments, and he's given the instructions on the tabernacle and the things in the tabernacle and what they're going to build and what they're going to need. And he's giving them all these things through all these chapters. You can see all of this, this detail that God is giving to Moses. And we come to chapter 32. Now God is testing them on the lesson of provision and the lesson of presence and the lesson of promise. He's testing them on all three of those things at the same time. So in verse 1, of Exodus chapter 32, it says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, for which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. All right, well, let's, let's do a quick review. Do you think that they've learned the lesson of God's promises and that God had promised to bring them to the promised land, do you think they had learned that lesson based on verse 1? Okay. Now, do you think that they had learned the lesson of uh, presence that God was going to be with them as he took them to the promised land? Did they learn that one? Did they learn the lesson of provision that God would take care of their needs so long as they were in the wilderness? No, they didn't. They didn't even learn the lesson of deliverance, which was only God can be the one who delivers. So Moses goes up into the mountain, and Moses has been up there for 40 days. I mean, that's, that's almost a month and a half. Moses has been up there, especially on the Jewish calendar. It is about a month and a half. He's been up in the mountain. And they, don't, they just assume after 40 days that he didn't take any food, he didn't take any water, Therefore, he probably is dead. He probably starved to death or died of thirst. Or, you know, we don't know what's become of him. He's probably just a goner. Now, if they understood that God can provide water from a rock and take contaminated water and make it clean, and he can rain bread and manna from heaven, should there have been any doubt as to Moses' ability to survive in the presence of God? No. But was there doubt? Now, before we beat up on them too much, do we not doubt that God's going to take care of us sometime? What we see in the beginning is an unexpected delay. We, we see that they haven't, uh, that they haven't uh, 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 planned on spending this much time on the mountain. They thought Moses would go up to the mountain, uh, you know, like pulling up to a drive through window. God would give him his order, and Moses would come back down, and that would be it. And in a few days, they would be on their way again. But a month and a half has gone by, and they don't know what's become of Moses. They assume he's probably dead by now. And so what they say is, up, make us gods. They tell Aaron, make us gods which shall go before us. Now, I used to think that they were determined to turn around and go back to Egypt. That's not what they're saying here. They're saying, we're going to go to the promised land, but we're going to make us our own gods to go to the promised land with. And the reasoning is, they say, for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Did Moses bring them up out of the land of Egypt? No. In fact, if you hold your place there and look at chapter 20 of Exodus. Verse 1 of chapter 20, And God spake all these words, saying, 
I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Who is the deliverer? Was it Moses or was it God? See, we put too much into Moses the deliverer. Moses was just the person God used to deliver them, but God was the deliverer. And they said, Moses, this guy that brought us up out of here. Notice God's not even in the picture anymore. It's been a month and a half. They're only three months removed from watching God split the Red Sea while they crossed it. Three months, and they've forgotten that. Now God is not even in the picture. This is Moses brought us up out here. Moses is the guy who did all this. Now he's probably dead. Now we have no God. Now we have no presence. We have no provision. We have nothing because Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, is not here. So Aaron, let's make us some gods that will go before us into the promise. Now, let me ask you something. We know what they made. They made a golden calf. What golden calves do you have in your life? Say, Pastor, I don't have any golden calves in my life. Are you sure about it? I could probably hit on some things this morning, and somebody would get mad. You know why? Because I dared touch their golden calf. Anything that you're hanging on to, anything that you're not willing to change, anything that you're not willing to submit to God on from his word in your life is your golden calf. And you worship it. Because we are human beings, and every human being worships something. There is no such thing as an atheist. All of us worship something. In Exodus chapter 19, in verses 17 and 18, it says, Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Moses is 40 days up on the mountain, but they still have a visible manifestation of the presence of God. This mountain is covered with a cloud, and there's smoke, and there's fire, and there's thundering, and there's shaking, and there's all kinds of things going on up there. So God is not just disappeared. They have a visible manifestation of the presence of God right in front of them. And while Moses is in the presence of God, they assume Moses has died and they've been abandoned and they better take matters into their own hands. Now, we look at that and we say, that's stupid. But when we get to a, a place in our Christian life where nothing is happening, we're just sitting around. And dare I say the Christian life gets boring That's when we get into trouble. Part of their problem is they just got bored. They got bored. Instead of spending their time actively worshiping God, actively praising God, rehearsing all the things that God had already done with them in the first few months of this journey, they got bored and they started to think of things to do on their own. Every parent in here knows that when your child gets bored, bad things happen. No child has ever had a good idea when they were bored. They're all bad. They're all destructive. You know, that's when the thought, I'm bored. Maybe I should play with matches. Maybe I should take the car out for a spin. Maybe I should jump off the roof in, onto a trampoline. You know, that's boredom produces those, that level of thinking. And so they come to Aaron and they say, up, make us gods that will go before us. Not only do we see an unexpected delay, but we see a redirected worship. 
Verse 2, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So it redirected worship. Now, Let's go back and rewind and think for a second. Questions help in gender learning. Where did slaves get gold? From the Egyptians. God had so messed up Egypt that they wanted them gone, and they started throwing money at them to get them to go faster. What do you need? You need my cart, you need my ox, here's some gold, here's all the cash I got, here's some rubies, here's some, here's some furs, here's some whatever, pots and pans and jars and oils and whatever I got, it's all yours, just go, please go. We Get, and they, the Bible says that they were thrust out of Egypt, like a child in the birth canal. They were pushed out of Egypt by the Egyptians, and, and they spoiled the Egyptians, that's what the Bible says. So it was God's deliverance that even gave them the things that they had at that moment, right? And they took what God had given them and used it to rebel against him. Can I say that you and I have been given many blessings by God and not one of them are intended for our personal gratification. They're intended for his glory. When Moses comes down the mountain with all the instructions, you know what all that gold and silver and furs and carts and all those things are supposed to be for? It's supposed to be for building the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, the tabernacle, the altar of incense, the brazen altar. All the things they would need in worshiping God, God gave them all that gold and all that stuff so that they could contribute to the worship of God in a meaningful way. Instead, they take what God had given them, and instead of using it the way God intended to, they use it for what they want to do. Do you have any golden calves in your life? If you take God's blessing and use it for yourself, you've made a golden calf. Golden calves, by the way, are not the way to make God happy with you, in case you didn't know that. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, the Bible says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We are to stand fast in the liberty that God has given us. But a few verses later, the Bible says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one. I'm glad as a believer in Christ, I have been set free. I have liberty. I'm, I'm not a slave to sin anymore. I'm at liberty. Why did God give me that liberty? So I can make myself happy? So I can serve my own lusts, my own desires? No, so I could serve my brother. So I could serve the other people in the family of God and bring glory to God through that. In James, he, in James chapter 4 and verse 3, he tells us, you ask and receive not, meaning you're praying and you're asking God for things, but God's not giving it to you because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. God is not going to answer the selfish prayers. At least you should hope he doesn't answer the selfish prayers. Every so often, God gives you what you want, even when it's the wrong thing. Like Israel wanted a king, and he gave them one, and they regretted it. But God said, you're going to worship, the, you're going to obey that king, you're going to follow that king, you're going to do what he tells you, and when he taxes you, you're going to pay it, because this is what you wanted, this is your bed, you made it, now you're lying in it. The Bible says we ask and we don't have because, you know, we, we want it for ourselves. Oh, I want, I want that promotion at work so I can feel better about myself, I can, I can buy more things, I can, I can have more of what I, I, I'm intending to do. God didn't give you your job so that you can glorify yourself. 
He hasn't given you your health so that you can glorify yourself. He hasn't given you your family so that you can gratify yourself. He's given it to you to glorify him. We see an unexpected delay, and then we see a redirected worship, and then down in verse 9, we see a righteous anger. Let's just read down, put it, get it all in there. Verse 5, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, meaning the golden calf. And Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. See, they were bored. Let's go play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people, which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt. See, you've got to be careful of the excuses you use with God because he'll throw them back at you. The people said, This man Moses has brought us up out of the land of Egypt. So God says, Moses, those, not my people, they're your people, the people you brought out of the land of Egypt. You don't want to go there with God. He'll play by your rules and still whip you. Like the foolish young lawyer that came to him and said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know what Jesus did? He humored the question. He didn't challenge the question. He humored it. And then he sent, that guy went away unhappy and unfulfilled because he knew there was nothing he could do to inherit eternal life. Jesus said, sell all your goods. Give it to the poor. That, that was too, a bridge too far. He didn't have to sell his goods and give it to the poor to inherit eternal life. He just had to believe in Jesus, which is far easier. Jesus said, okay, you don't want to believe in me? You want to do it your way? Okay, here's what you have to do. It's going to hurt far more to do it your way than my way. My way, you just have to believe on me. Your way, you have to sell everything that you have. Something I know you're not going to do. At least the man went away knowing he was lost. Hopefully, at some point in his life, he realized he was talking to the Savior to place his faith in Christ. Otherwise, he's burning in hell today. So these people that you brought, verse, um, verse 8, it says, they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed therein too and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. You know what that means? I've seen enough. I have seen, it's been three months plus, now 40 days plus three months. I have seen enough. I've reached my limit, Moses. I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that, I may, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and will make of thee a great nation. They weren't that long into the journey. But every time God was trying to teach them something or test them on something, they rebelled. They refused him. They wanted to complain when they didn't have what they wanted. And God was so mad, he said, Moses, move out of the way. I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to kill them all, and I'm going to start over with you. You're still a descendant of Abraham. We'll just do it that way. Don't ever think that your sin doesn't still offend God. Oh, I'm saved. He loves me. I can do whatever I want. Uh-uh. You don't think a holy and righteous God sees our sin and his blood starts boiling? Don't you think God would still be just and still be righteous if he had smitten us long ago? We think because we're saved, we're, we're something. But we're only something because he's made us that something. But yet we still sin, and, and, and again, there are times we make mistakes, and we fail, and we're trying to do the right thing, and we still do the wrong thing, and there are times we just, just fall into temptation. But there are times that believers rebel against God, and they say, I'm not doing that. And you don't think God the Father is sitting up in heaven saying, get out of the way, I'm going down there. 
I can tell you God still feels the same about sin and rebellion against him now as he did then. But God didn't destroy them all. You know why God didn't destroy them all? Because Moses got between God and them. Verse 11, and Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy, thy, thy wrath wax hot against thy people? Which thou, don't put this on me, which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Remember, I didn't want to do this in the first place. I said, pick somebody else. Moses said, you're not dumping them on me. These are not my people and I didn't bring them out. They're your people. Oh, I love the relationship Moses and the Lord had. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Moses here is a picture of Christ. You know, when you rebel against God and God's blood boils and he's ready to come down and do some smiting, you know who's between him and you? Jesus Christ. Son, step out of the way. I'm going down there. I have seen enough of this person. Jesus, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh-uh. No, we, this, we can't do this. Well, why can't God do this? What's the argument that Moses makes? Does he make the argument that the those people are just misguided, and they'll learn in time, and it'll be okay. Uh, we'll work on them. Just be a little more patient. Does Moses bring that argument into the case? No. Does Moses say, you know, I agree. They drive me crazy. You know, why don't you just snap your fingers and change them into something that's a little more friendly? No. Moses makes two arguments. These are the two, only two arguments, by the way, that ever work with God. If you're going to change God's mind about something, you're going to have to make these two arguments, and you're going to have to be just and right in making these two arguments. The first argument is based on God's reputation. God, if you go down there and do what you said you're going to do, then the Egyptians and everyone else is going to say, their God brought them out in the wilderness just to kill them in the mountains. And it's going to make you look bad. He didn't say, boy, these people aren't that bad. Give them another chance. Moses didn't even bring them up, really. What he said was, you delivered these people, and if you do what you're planning to do now, it'll make you look bad. And God's never going to do anything to make himself look bad. As I said, God is interested in glorifying himself and bringing glory and honor to himself. In John chapter 17 and verse 1, as Jesus was praying, hours before he'd be arrested and crucified, said, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. You know what Jesus said? You glorify me so that in this hour I can bring glory to you. Don't glorify me for my sake. Glorify me for your sake. Jesus' uh, whole motivation was to glorify the Father. I do always those things that please the Father. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 9, the Bible says, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. All the way through the arguments of Romans, the book of Romans, by the time you get to chapter 15, why are the Gentiles in this? So that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. Why would God give the gospel to the Gentiles and not just the Jews? So that the Gentiles can bring glory to him like he wanted the Jews to. 
But the Jews refused to bring glory to him, so he gave the gospel to the Gentiles for the purpose of bringing glory to God. What happens if the Gentiles will refuse to glorify God? Same thing will happen to the Gentiles that happen to the Jews. He'll cut them off, and he'll go back to the Jews. He makes that argument. You're, you're the wild olive grafted into the tree. And if God would cut off the natural branch to graft you in, don't think if you don't produce some fruit, he won't cut you off. That's the argument. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, it says, We are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Why, did, why were you bought with a price? And that price was the blood of Christ, by the way. Why were you bought by God out of slavery? It was so that you could glorify him. That's why he did it. In the end, the thing that matters most to God is that he be glorified. You say, that sounds awful selfish. Well, if you don't like it, you create your own universe and you do whatever you want with it. But he's, only, he's created this one. This is the only one I know of. And since he's the creator and he's the almighty and he's the omnipotent, he gets to decide what he wants and what he wants is to be glorified in his creation. He didn't create creation so that we could have soap operas and dramas and music and all kind of, he, he created the universe so that it would all give glory and honor to him. That's what he did. God doesn't withhold his wrath from us because we are so wonderful. He withholds his wrath so that he will be glorified for his mercy. By the way, don't mistake that, that the fact that God is merciful and he doesn't squash us like bugs. Don't interpret that as our sin's not a big deal. Our sin is a big deal. It's just his mercy is a bigger deal. And we should glorify him for that. Every one of us in this room deserves for God to strike us dead right now where we sit. We didn't deserve to walk into this building today. We don't deserve to walk out of it. But God is merciful. And we ought to make a big deal about his mercy. And we ought to glorify him for it. That's what he wants. So when God the Father says, I've seen enough, here I come, and Jesus gets in the way, Father, your mercy is a way in which they can glorify you. That was the first argument. You know what the second argument is? The second argument is based on God's word. The first is based on God's reputation. The second is based on God's word. Moses tells God, you promise Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you promised these people that you would deliver them out of bondage and you would bring them to the land of promise. You promised. And you cannot lie. So you have to do what you promised. Those are the only two arguments that ever appeal to God. You appeal to God on your own righteousness or your own talents or your own abilities, you will lose that trial. But if you appeal to God based on his name, his reputation, and his word, you'll win every time. You promise this, you can't do it. And when God heard how he would be glorified by not destroying them and how he would keep his promise, now, God didn't need reminded of it, don't get me wrong. But because of those two arguments, God said, okay, I won't destroy them. Now, a few chapters later, you read Moses goes back up the mountain, and he says, God, I changed my mind, wipe them all out. And God talks Moses off the ledge. They have a great relationship. When you study Moses and God and their relationship, their interactions between each other, Moses and God had a relationship unlike any other in that era. Moses probably knew God better than any human being to that point and spoke, as it were, face to face. The Bible doesn't really say that about anybody else. Nothing we do is going to get God's attention like reminding him of his promises. Remember, the promise is one of the lessons. So when we, when we sin, when we, when we mess up, Satan will tell us, 
God doesn't want anything more to do with you. But God has a promise that he said if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When I, when I make confession in my prayer time and I say, Lord, I, I failed on this test again. I failed again. And I ask God to forgive me. I don't say, God, if you forgive me, I'll do better. God, if you forgive me. I say, God, you promised that your faithfulness would be enough for cleansing and forgiveness. I'm confessing I was wrong. And I'm throwing myself on your faithfulness to do what you said you would do, to cleanse me. God will always keep his promises. So everything worked out good. Moses went down the mountain. Um, he had a nice stern talking with them, and they all sang Kumbaya. And, uh, and it was great. They had all the lessons down, and they went to the promised land, and it was great. Right? No. Skip with me down to verse 19. Exodus chapter 32, verse 19. They came to pass as soon as he came nigh to the camp, that's Moses, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. He just talked God off the ledge, now he's hot. And he came, uh, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it with the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. God can forgive you, and he does, but you're still going to drink of the water you've made. Don't get into this idea that, well, I'm a Christian, and so I can get away with anything. The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You made it, now you're going to drink it. Later on, the Bible says God plagued them because of the calf. I think that plague came from the water that Moses contaminated with what they had built. And there were people that were sick, and there were people that were hurting, and there were people that were dying. Go down to verse 25, it says, And Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from the gate, from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Lastly, we see that there's a deadly consequence. These people are pictures of the believer. There are times when there are deadly consequences on the believer for their sin. There are times when God says, you can't bring me any more glory, so I'm just taking you out. You're still saved. Paul talked about this at the throne, that some are going to stand before the throne of God with no reward left over whatsoever. It's all going to be burned up in the fire of his judgment, and there's going to be nothing, but they'll still be saved, though they have nothing to show for it. James talks about a sin unto death, and he says, don't pray for that. The Bible says there is a sin unto death. There are times when God says, okay, I'm done, and he takes you home. Don't lose your salvation, but the consequences are deadly. We have a New Testament example of this. Don't think I'm just pulling this out of whole cloth out of the Old Testament because it was still happening this way in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Corinthian church was taking the Lord's Supper and doing it in a, in a, in a carnal way, and in an immoral way. And this is what Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote to them as the consequence of what they were doing. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily 
eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. He's talking to believers. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and some sleep. Paul said, God's judgment for your wicked use of the Lord's Supper has meant people are sick, people are infirm, and people have died. Just like in Exodus 32. Some people got sick, some people were infirm, and some people died because of their sin. Now, God doesn't do this when we forget something. If we skip church one Sunday, God doesn't, doesn't destroy us. But when we rebel against God, we are taking a risk an uncalculated risk because I think people who rebel against God haven't learned enough to know what they're doing. They're too ignorant to even calculate the risk they're taking with God. One of the problems we have in Christianity today is we don't fear God like we ought to. We think Jesus is our buddy and God is our daddy and it's all cool and now he's going to bless whatever I do. That ain't happening. So God comes to you, whether it's through this series or another message, or you're listening to a podcast, you're reading the Bible, you're doing, spending some time with him in the Word, and he comes to you and he says, knock it off. Stop that. And you say, yeah, but I like that. When I read a passage from the Scripture, or you read a passage from the Scripture, and it says, I'm supposed to be doing this as a believer, and you say, yeah, but that's going to be really inconvenient. I don't know if I'm going to do that. Well, coming to church is going to cut into my family time. Well, you know what? Your family is your calf. Don't make God destroy it. Oh, but if I, if I tell my boss that I need Sundays off, I might lose my job. Well, you know, I don't know. You might. It may be God's will for you not to be in a job where you can't worship him, and serve in his body. That, in fact, is always his will. It's never God's will for you to be working to the point you can't attend church and serve. You might have to stand up and say, well, oh, but what am I going to do if I lose my job? I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose my car. Didn't you learn the lesson of provision? Didn't you learn the lesson of presence? He's with you all the time. Didn't you learn the lesson of promise? He's taking you on a journey somewhere. It's pretty amazing. And he wants, he wants you to live in a land flowing with milk and honey. He doesn't want you in the wilderness forever. He wants you in the promised land. And Israel had to leave some things behind in that wilderness before they could go to the promised land. It wasn't just about getting God into them. It was about getting Egypt out of them. And as believers, we need to stop thinking like Americans, and we need to start thinking like believers. Well, I might not be able to buy the newest iPhone when it comes out. Good. It's not worth a bucket of warm spit, in my opinion, anyway. The one that was released eight years ago does about the same thing. I remember when we had phones for making phone calls. Now our phones do everything but make phone calls. How much time do you spend actually talking on the phone versus using it for something else? It's not, they're not really our cell phones, they're our cell entertainment system. What's your golden calf? Probably a built one, you just don't want to admit it. Whatever you won't give to God is your calf. Don't make him come down, grind it to powder. He will. He will. And if you keep building more calves, he may one day just take you home. I've seen enough. You say, boy, that, that doesn't sound like a God of love. Oh, no, it is. He's a God of love, but he's a God of holiness, too. 
We can't have one without the other. Let's stand together for prayer. Heavenly Father, I 